On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at You Need God. When I was in the seminary, some of our professors insisted. They said, you study theology. You study the faith on your knees. This isn't just an intellectual game. If, you're, if you want to study the things of God, you need God. You need to be listening to His voice. And so they told us, study on your knees. Four dimensions or um, components to the human person, to us as human beings, that we need to care for. All four of these components. The spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual, and the physical. And they say this corresponds with loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so the spiritual, obviously, as human beings, we're spiritual. We need to be fed spiritually. We need spiritual life. We do that through prayer, through reading scripture, through other things. The emotional, as human beings, again, we're relational. We need to have friendships. We need to have life-giving relationships. We need to share life with other people. We need to take care of our emotional side. Intellectual, again, as human beings, we're thinking people. And it's not good to let our brains go to mush. And so we should always be learning. Each one of us should be an ongoing learner. And then finally, the physical component. component. We're not disembodied spirits. We have physical bodies, and we need to care for our physical bodies. We need to exercise, get proper sleep and nutrition, all of that type of thing. I want to speak about um, St. Dominic and focus on the intellectual component, a component we don't pay much attention attention to because it's not the most exciting component but let's look at it today because we're looking at saint dominic uh saint dominic one of the great saints of the church he um was spanish from from spain and he lived in the late 12th early 13th century and he lived at a very low time in the church the church had a lot of power a lot of influence and was very wealthy and because of that, it was very corrupt. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, again, corruption, scandal in the church. The, the leaders in the church, uh, many of them were very worldly and not very spiritual. And so it was also a time of prophets and reformers. First of all, within the church, St. Dominic lived at the same time as St. Francis of Assisi, the founder of the Franciscans. We know St. Francis was the one the Lord said to Francis, Francis, rebuild my church. And Francis, you know, led led a following of thousands and thousands of friars who lived the gospel radically, who embraced poverty and all that type of thing, really bringing a reform to the church. And there were others like St. Francis at the time of St. Dominic. And St. Dominic was one of these reformers as well. But there were also reformers who who were trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, what they called heretics, people who were saying, you know what, the church, uh, you know, shouldn't have the Pope, the Pope isn't really of God, and priesthood is no good, and the Mass is no good, and all that type of thing. And so, so again, people seeing the weakness of the church and taking advantage of it to, to try to take away even what was good in the church, uh, try, again, trying to throw out people trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so in the midst of this, St. Dominic led and founded a new order in the church known as the Order of Preachers, better known today as simply the Dominicans. The Dominican order is one of the greatest orders in the church, a great order in the church. And every order has a unique spirituality or unique charism. And the charism of the Dominicans was they loved to study. They were uh, men uh, 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 who, who, who loved to study, who, who loved learning. And uh, one of the key scripture to, to kind of give perspective of this love they had is from Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. The Lord says, My people are ruined for lack of knowledge. Or other translations have, My people are dying for lack of knowledge. And we know at at the time of St. Dominic, very much uh, like today, there was many, many Catholics who were ignorant. And they were so easy to confuse. 
people who wanted to confuse these Catholics who didn't know much about their faith. It was the easiest thing in the world. And so there was a desperate need for preachers, for preachers who knew their stuff, preachers who knew their scriptures, preachers who knew the history of the church, preachers who knew, who knew theology. They say St. Dominic, he had the Gospel of Matthew pretty much memorized. And he had Paul's writings pretty much memorized. He had them always with him, and he was reading them over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and, and again, his followers very much had this, this, this same understanding that God's people need understanding. They need to know the truth. They need clarity. They need to be taught. Uh, and so again, the Dominicans... Uh, weren't the first to do this. They were continuing a tradition in the church of intellectualism. For example, St. Augustine, a great mind, a great uh, teacher of, of the church. But what was beautiful and, and essential was this intellectualism of St. Dominic and his followers was very much rooted in prayer and contemplation. These were holy men. Like Francis, they lived lives of poverty. They were not caught up in the riches and the power and whatever else that much of the church was caught up in, much of the church leaders were caught, in, caught up in. These were, these were men who lived the gospel radically and who were men of prayer and contemplation. And, and um, two, two classic images for how to approach studies that I'm sure the Dominicans would have modeled. First of all, when I was in the seminary, some of our professors insisted. They said, you study theology. You study the faith on your knees. This isn't just an intellectual game. If, you're, if you want to study the things of God, you need God. You need to be listening to His voice. And so they told us, study on your knees. Now, they didn't mean that literally because you spend long hours studying as a seminarian. Your knees would be completely worn out uh, within a short time. But again, the, I, the, this image of s you study on your knees. You, you, you need God's help. And then the second image um, is from John chapter 13, verse 23 to 25. And again, all of the intellectual tradition in the church, those who, who emphasize uh, intellectual learning, they all point to this passage in John um, one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, that's you, that should be you, was reclining at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter nodded to him to find out whom he meant. He leaned back against Jesus' chest and said, Master, who is it? And again, the, the, in the tradition of the church, they've always seen this beloved disciple, who, you know, John the Evangelist, uh, leaning his head against the heart of Jesus. Someone who was listening to the heart of Jesus, who was close to Jesus. And again, the, the, the true intellectuals of the church are meant to be people who have their ear against the heart of Jesus, who are listening to His heart even as they study. And again, in the seminary and in other uh, conferences and stuff, oftentimes you would meet a great theologian or a scripture scholar. And boy, when they taught, you could tell they prepared on their knees. And you could tell they had their ear against the heart of Jesus because again, their teaching, it came, it, it, it came from the Spirit. Again, it was intellectually profound, sound, but also Spirit-filled. And so again, this would have been very much the tr uh, the the, the what, what the Dominicans, what St. Dominic and his people and his, his brothers were, were living. We know uh, in the Gospels, Jesus reiterates the call to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And oftentimes we forget the mind part. You know, again, a lot of us as, as Christians, we, 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 we want to love God, we might pray a lot, but that we, we also must love Him with all our mind. Every one of us has a duty to learn our faith, to study our faith. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 29, this is the passage we're all familiar with. It. It's a key passage here at the center. In verse 28, the Lord says, Come to me, all you who labor and are, and are burdened, 
and I will give you rest. And he goes on to say, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And the next verse, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now this little passage here, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now in some translations, especially in other languages, the, the, the expression learn from me, uh, the wording that's actually used is be schooled by me or come to my school. And again, the imagery of Jesus being a teacher, being a master, being, being, being someone who, 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 who has disciples who come to his school and he teaches them. And each one of us should see ourselves as Jesus' students. He's my teacher. I go to his school. I learn from him. I'm schooled by him. I, I learn from him. And not only for a short time, but our whole life. Again, each one of us should be ongoing learners. We should be constantly, not, you know, not... not not like 24 hours a day, but, but part of our daily life, part of our rhythm of life should be study and learning. Because again, Jesus says, come to me and learn from me. Be schooled by me. And again, he doesn't just mean for a short time. He means our whole life to be constantly learning. I remember uh, back in Ottawa, there was a gentleman from St. Mary's Parish, our mother parish. He passed away and he had a beautiful, left a beautiful legacy or family he had. His children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, all still involved in the, in the parish. And he died at a, at a very old age. But his daughter, in the eulogy, she said he never stopped learning. The day he died, he was watching his TV program, you know, by some preacher, you know, and taking notes or whatever. I don't know if it was the day he died or the day before he died. But, but, but she said he never stopped learning. And we should all be like that too, to never, never stop learning, to never stop going to Jesus' school. Are you still in his school? I hope, you're all, I hope we're all in his school. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Now, again, the key uh, sources of learning should be, first of all, of course, Scripture. You know, especially as Catholics, we should know our Scriptures. We should love the Scriptures. We should spend time daily in Scripture. Secondly, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, a wonderful resource. There's also the Compendium. And then books. There's so many wonderful, wonderful books. And nowadays you can get CDs. You can get top-notch teachings on CD, on DVDs. We can take classes. We can take courses, even on YouTube now. Um, we, we all, we're all familiar with the scripture from Ben Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, whatever you want to call it. Uh, chapter 6, verse 36. If you see the intelligent, seek them out. Let your foot wear away their doorsteps. Have you ever heard that scripture before? Sometimes it simply says, if you meet, if you meet a wise man, wear out his doorstep. Now again, this learning should be above all motivated by love. If we love God, we want to know everything about Him. You know, when someone falls in love with a boy, when a boy falls in love with a girl, he wants to know everything about her. Like, what do you like to do? You know, where did you grow up? Like, whatever, everything about her. And so to ourselves, uh, if we truly love God, we should want to know everything we can about Him. Again, our, our, our motivation for studying should come of all first and, above, first and foremost out of love for Him. And we know, of course, Scripture says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. This studying, is a, there's an element of, uh, it's, it's seeking the Lord. And, and oftentimes, or not oftentimes, almost all the time, when someone has a conversion, they start reading the books. That's a sign of a conversion, is wanting to learn more about our awesome God. And so again, each one of us should, should expect this. This should be um, a big part of our life. 
Again, St. Dominic and his brothers, they exemplified this. The, 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 and and there, there are other orders in the community that have a similar emphasis, you know, just a great love of learning, but, but through prayer and through, through, uh, through, through contemplation. Now, for some, for some people, you know, you might be saying, yeah, but that's not my thing, you know, like I'm not really an academic type, I'm not an intellectual type. And if that's the case, that's fine. But I know that there are many of you here tonight who are the intellectual academic learning types many of you are very intelligent many of you do a lot of reading and you must study your faith some of you are younger people maybe 13 maybe 14 you need to start learning your faith you can't have a childish faith your whole life. We need to have a childlike faith, but not a childish faith. If we have questions about the faith, we shouldn't just get confused, doubt, and give up the faith. We should study. We should investigate. For me personally, uh, for me to have a rich prayer life, I need to be feeding my intellect new information. I need to be learning more about God, reading, reading good books, listening to good CDs, and all of that type of, uh, t- type of thing. And so again, uh, going back to you young people, the 13, the 14, the 15, 16-year-olds, when you go on to become parents, you should have a very good understanding of your faith. When your children ask you questions about the, the faith, you should surprise them. Like, how does mom know all of this stuff? You know? And, and even more so, when you become grandparents, you should completely shock your grandchildren. When they ask questions about the faith, they should be in awe. Wow, here is a man, here is a woman who has studied his, her faith their whole life. They know it well. You can't, you can't confuse them. You can't, you can't kind of stump them because they know their faith. And again, unfortunately, so many Catholics are, are so ignorant of their faith, you throw out some scripture out of context, and you go, ah, you know, they're completely confused. That should never be one of us. We should spend our whole life in the school of Jesus, letting him lead us and teach us. And so again, we give thanks to St. Dominic and, his, and all the, the saints who have followed in his order, St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the great Dominican uh, saints. Um, and also, again, today in a particular way, let us remember that we're still in school. Every one of us must be an ongoing learner. We must love God with all our mind. Uh, We must be people who lean our head against the heart of Jesus, listening to his heart, letting, letting letting him teach us so that we can love God more perfectly, because we know him more deeply, we've sought him mo- more wholeheartedly, and so we can share the faith with clarity, with conviction, and with love to others who are dying for lack of knowledge. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Mark Goring on You Need God, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of program 1758. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at We Walk by Faith. Brothers and sisters, we walk by faith. We walk by faith. We're, 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 we're meant to, to, to walk in the Spirit. We don't know where we're going, but the Lord is telling us, keep going. Keep going anyways to the promised land.
You know, my, my dad has lots of expressions. And one of the favorites that he has is, you know, there aren't really any new ideas. We just reuse other people's ideas. And I've realized that recently that, that this inspiration I've had as of late, I inadvertently stole it from St. Paul. Let me explain. Recently, I ran a marathon. <laughs> yeah, a full 26 uh, odd miles at, at my advanced age. I actually wasn't planning on running a full marathon. I, um, I thought I had gotten ahead of the curve and signed up in January. I was going to run the half, and even that was going to be a stretch. But the half was full, and so I had to sign up for the full marathon, the full 26 odd miles. And obviously there's a lot of uh, preparation to get ready for the marathon. I wasn't really a seasoned runner at that point, um, but I, f I felt something I wanted to do, and you know, I felt it was something maybe even God would have me do. And um, so there's all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of training involved and all kinds of different kinds of training. And in looking at training for a marathon, it's very much like the spiritual life. Like to train for the marathon, there's five or six different things you need to do to properly prepare to run a long distance. Number one, you have to run short distances at a fast pace. Because if you want to run a fast 42 kilometers, that starts with running a fast one kilometer. At the other end, you have to let your body get used to running a long distance. So you have to have a number of long runs um, before the race to get your body used to it. But you don't run the full 42.2 because that's just too hard on your body. And then you need to do special training for hills to train your body to basically, you know, build up your quads and your calves to get ready for hills. And there's other things, too, that you need to do in there. There's other things related to nutrition. You need to have the right amount of carbohydrates before you race. You need to be hydrated. And I couldn't help but think that all these five or six or seven different aspects of training for the marathon are not unlike the spiritual life. We don't do just one thing. We do six or seven different things to prepare and to stay in the race. So we, we pray, and we fast, and we take time alone. We have silence, and we take silence and solitude, and we do penance, and we do acts of charity. We do a multiplicity of things to prepare for the race. Now, of course, this clever idea is not mine at all. St. Paul is 2,000 years ahead of me. And the reason why he used that analogy was, was for a more striking reason, not just for some, you know, social event uh, in a city, but because it had real meaning. And so we read from uh, 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul will use the analogy of a race. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So what's really important here is the historical context. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, the people in Corinth, which would be modern-day Greece. Right? And the reason why this metaphor would be very strong to them is because, is actually for the same reason, is the same sort of historical context for the origin of the marathon, that there was a runner who ran from Marathon, a place near the sea where there was a a sea battle going on, and he ran to Athens to tell the people that the battle had been won. And it was a very important message, <laughs> you know, a life-threatening message. 
But he ran so hard and so far, it took his life. And it's a very, very powerful metaphor because we run this race. And part of running this race is because we have a message. (laughs) And delivering this message will cost us our lives. Because Jesus says, if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. And so this man had this important saving message for the people to say that the battle has been won. (laughs) You will live. And he spent his life doing it. And so are we. We are to spend our lives in sharing the message of Jesus through our example and through sharing the message itself. But we do not run aimlessly. We train ourselves. So we are to run this race, but we need to train for it at the same time. So there's things we need to do. So we have this, all of us are called to be marathon runners in the spirit. All of us have a message that we are to deliver and we will spend our lives delivering it. But to do that, to make it to our Athens from marathon, we need to train. And so we need to, we need to pray, we need to serve, we need to be in fellowship with others. We need many things to be able to make it to our Athens, spending our lives sharing the message of life. Amen. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1758. And today's topic, Father Mark Goring on, You Need God. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post-dated checks or through our website, to help fulfill the Great Commission from Matthew 2819. Go and make disciples of all nations. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at We Walk by Faith. Brothers and sisters, we walk by faith. We walk by faith. We're, 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 we're meant to, to, to walk in the Spirit. We don't know where we're going, but the Lord is telling us, keep going. Keep going anyways to the promised land. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.